Are you seeing markets in the green? And Alexis, pretty riveting speech by Fed Chief Jerome Powell just now. Pretty riveting, pretty historic, too. And the market uh, we saw react very swiftly. Uh, we've got the S&P and NASDAQ at record highs. The market was lower, we should say. The futures were lower before Jerome Powell began to speak. And as he gave his speech, we saw things turn around dramatically. I think the big takeaway from his speech, uh, given the fact that uh, you know he was talking about the Fed now looking at inflation and its inflation goal in a different way, the big takeaway, at least for investors, is that interest rates are going to stay low uh, for the foreseeable future. I'd love to get thoughts from our Fed correspondent, uh, Brian Chung, uh, on that as well. So, Brian, what was your big uh, takeaway from what we heard? Well, the major takeaway is really just as you laid it out, that the Federal Reserve has changed its thinking so that it will tolerate inflation going above 2% if it means that the labor market can tighten even further and that more people that are unemployed can get pulled back into that market. So I think we need to add some historical context to all of this. So keep in mind that after the last financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, uh, the Federal Reserve was jostling with how it wanted to approach inflation. They set a 2% goal in 2012. That was the nexus of this long run policy statement that the Federal Reserve revised today. But since that point in time in 2012, inflation as measured by core personal consumption expenditures, which doesn't include energy or food, only touched 2% very briefly in 2018, six years after it codified that 2% goal. So when we talk about the change today where the Federal Reserve says it will tolerate inflation rising above its 2% inflation goal moderately, uh, that means that that might not come into play until many years from now. Uh, keep in mind that if we're, t if we're looking at the uh, high-frequency data for right now, the core PCE is really running at about 0.9% well below the 2% goal. That's because of the deflationary pressures of this COVID-19 crisis. So if anything, you can read this statement as or read this long-term change as something that in the short term means that we can expect these interest rates to stay at near zero for much longer than maybe we had experienced or expected prior to the Fed making this change. But largely, it seems like these are marginal tweaks here. I wouldn't read into this as the Fed raising its inflation target per se. Again, the clarifying fact here is that the Fed would tolerate moderately higher inflation in the short term. Jay Powell saying in his speech today that this is really just codifying thinking that we've already been using over the past few years. Let's bring in uh, Michael Lee of Michael Lee Strategy. Michael, uh, you know this speech probably sucks for? The financials. Uh, and in our digital green room, you highlighted, highlighted some negative action in the XLF, I guess unsurprising. You know, um, actually, it, it's uh, treasuries have, have sold off. And as the yield curve has steepened, uh, financials have rallied significantly. Mm -hmm. um, this is really perplexing because the way that I see it, uh, with ZERP basically in perpetuity, that uh, the yield curve will never steepen. And with all the treasury issuance that we've had, uh, there's so much supply out there. So the velocity of money uh, is just never going to pick up again. I, I don't know in my lifetime. What you are seeing is the Japanification of America. And I think this conversation about inflation and how they're going to look at inflation, it's all academic because inflation uh, in, in the core CPI sense, I don't know that we'll ever see that again. We have There is too much supply out there. And unless we figure out a way to add a tremendous amount of output to our economy vis-a-vis -vis onshoring like 100% of the manufacturing from China to America, uh, we, are, we are simply headed uh, to a Japan type situation. And the next big announcement from the Fed is gonna be managing the yield curve. Then it will be negative interest rates. This is the path that we're headed on. This is the road that we're heading on. And so for me to see the financials rallying and treasury selling off, maybe just the market was expecting more draconian action uh, from Powell, and because we did not get more draconian action in terms of uh, some new bond buying program, uh, something else to suppress interest rates, we've seen a sell off in gold. You've seen a sell off in silver. You've seen a sell off in interest rates. You know, and, and then you've seen financials rally. Where in reality, I would think you would see the opposite. So, um, it, it, you know, this is kind of. Uh, I think the market was expecting something more stimulative from the Fed, more something that would cause more inflation. But no central bank has ever been able to create inflation in history. Central banks can stop inflation uh, and they can slow it down, but no central bank has ever been able to create it. You've seen this in the EU and you've seen this in Japan, and now you're going to see this in America unless, unless we can create a um, an economy that that really values high output 
sectors and manufacturing. And with automation coming online, I just don't know that that's possible. I, I'm hopeful for it, but I, I just don't know. Well, Michael, can you explain for people why the Fed would want inflation to go higher? Because on its face, that sounds kind of absurd that you would want the cost of living to rise, especially at a time when so many people are out of work and hurting. Um, when inflation is this low, right, it, it, you need a certain amount of inflation for the economy to grow. So you don't want inflation running at 7, 8, 9%, but you also don't want it at zero or going the other direction. Because when that heads in the other direction, the economy is not growing. It's, it's a bit of a Goldilocks-like situation where that 2% target, if the Fed can get close to it, it's really healthy for the economy as you have um, – that leads to wage gains. Um, that leads to um, you know, certain asset price gains. Um, and and that, that's just you know, what you would say the natural order of how our economy has always run. Right. So uh, it's we've now in a situation where th there is just simply too much government debt out there and that the M2 in the system has grown by 25 percent March since March. And wh while simultaneously uh, the velocity of money has you know screeched to the slowest crawl it ever has. So, I, I mean, the Fed wants inflation now. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. That's necessarily a great thing for people over the long run. You want a little bit of inflation because it shows the signs of a healthy economy. But I don't know that we'll ever see it again in our lifetime. What we've seen in the response to the pandemic may have Japanified the U.S. economy in perpetuity. Hey, it's Brian Chung here. So I guess I want to expand on the Japanification comment there. I mean, what's been interesting is that this is really not about anything that the Federal Reserve is doing right now. This is all about communication to try to get inflation expectations, not necessarily current inflation, inflation expectations up in the future. And I think that I guess the Federal Reserve was worried that we would have a Japanification uh, in effect if the Fed did not change its long run statement today as it did. So I guess I'm wondering, could you see at some point the Fed getting backed up into negative rate territory like the Bank of Japan has done or other types of BOJ related actions like getting into equities, purchasing ETFs, uh, things like that? Brian, it, it's all – that's a great question. I think that's all on the way. Um, I think the – I think it's going to happen regardless of who wins the election. I think the next – uh, step that comes is the managing of the yield curve as the borrowing from the United States, um, you, you know, the deficits, if you if you look at what's, what the deficit is going to be this year and what the deficit is going to be next year. Um, as the excess supply comes in the market, I think yield curve managing is next. Then after that, um, you run and then if you see some sort of massive equity correction, uh, you see more aggressive buying of uh, in, in investment grade bonds, then high yield bonds, and then equities would be, then be after that, I would expect in the form of ETFs. Uh, all these things are in our future unless we can fundamentally change the underlying of our economy and create and close the output gap. Um, Larry Summers w was famous for calling for secular stagnation. And it seemed uh, in 2018, when the Fed started raising interest rates, uh, sorry, in 17 and 18, they started raising interest rates that we might be able to meet that head on. And as the Fed started moving away from ZERP, you actually saw the velocity of money increase. Because once you incentivize uh, banks to lend and you have higher, higher margins, higher, um, you know, loosen up credit in the society to some of the riskier parts, that can create a debt bubble on the other side and, and create a recession on the other side. But we are a boom bust economy. Now, banks have too much money. So there's too much supply out there for that velocity of money to ever really increase to a level where it's going to be inflationary. So the next step, I'd say, is managing the yield curve. Uh, if you see a massive equity correction, you're going to see a huge buying of, um, of I think, uh, investment-grade ETFs above and beyond what they're doing now, then high yield, and then equities would come at some point along the lines of managing the yield curve and then negative rates would be after. Uh, I, I, I'd say that's years down the road. And at that point, we'll have much further evidence as the effectiveness of negative interest rates. Um, it, it's yet to be seen if that uh, in itself is an effective 
uh, strategy for central banks. So I don't get, so if we're crossing that bridge three or four years from now, and it's been proven that that's a waste of time or it doesn't help, we may not see that, but yield curve control is coming next. And then in, in an event of a 10 or 20% equity correction, you'll see additional bond buying from the fed in the form of investment grade, high yield, and then buying equities would, would, would come, I think shortly after that, if that didn't work.